Hey guys, Jinzo and Tonic here, with a special guest joining me today on my channel, Chris Perovic. If you don't know who this man is, <laughs> this is the perfect time for you to find out. He was the founding member of the legendary team, Team Overdose, um, which dominated in many competitions, but mainly during the 2005 GOAT format era. The reason why we have Chris Perovic on the channel today is to talk about the World Championships coming up for GOAT format soon. Um, and it's all about basically becoming a world champion. So with Worlds Around the Corner, I just wanted to get Chris Perovic's input and insight on how to prepare and what you should be doing in order to try and be the next world champion. So unfortunately, due to our busy lives and the time difference in countries, uh, Chris and I weren't able to actually get uh, a phone call audio going between us so we were only able to send through voice note messages and replies and answers that way. So it's not going to be a fluid conversation, but the information and the insight that Chris is still going to give is still very, very, very valuable to new and old players of the game. Um, this man has a lot to give and a lot to teach. And it's if you want to become the next world champion, he's, he's one of the best players to learn from. So let's go. So Chris, just for the first question, I wanted to find out how long have you been playing Yu-Gi-Oh competitively, and what have you been? What have been your best results at tournaments that you've been to in the past? I started playing Yu-Gi-Oh competitively in 2004. That's when I started going to regionals and national tournaments, and that continued all the way up until I quit in 2008. I came back briefly in 2013 for one event. Uh, because it happened to be 20 minutes from my house and there wasn't any way I was going to miss that. Um, and in total in that time period, I have, uh, I've gotten eight Shonen Jump Championship tops and one YCS top, uh, with the highest place being second place a few times. Outside of that, I have topped and won uh, a lot of regionals. I've actually lost count. Um, and then as far as online tournaments go, I think I'm best known in the GOAT format community for uh, my team, Mostly Harmless, winning the 2014 Summer War League uh, because that deck kind of went on to become the standard for GOAT control for a few years. Um, after that, another team I led, Team Detox, went on to win Season 1 of Dual Scrown Warring. And finally, I've won a lot of luxury gaming tournaments that didn't really have any names to them. And that brings us to the current era, where I think the most prestigious uh, events going on in Go Format nowadays are Format Library Championships and GoFormat.com Championships. Uh, unfortunately, my schedule is kind of tight, and I haven't been able to play in any of these uh, until recently. Uh, I did play in uh, FLC 13, and I actually happened to win that one as well. Uh, most people I don't think recognized me, but my alias was Humble Robot. So, yeah, that's that's all my credentials. Chris, as a legend of the game, I just wanted to find out what advice can you give to players um, that are preparing for Worlds, uh, the players that have made it into the competition, or p potentially players that want to make it into the competition in future dates or future events. Um, what advice can you give them? Okay, so this is actually a really good question, uh, but it's also probably the most frustrating one for me to answer personally, uh, because it's the one I get the most. Uh, it's always, hey Chris, you know, what do you think is the best deck type, or what should I be testing in advance of this tournament or that tournament? And uh, the truth is that my answer changes depending on who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to a, a good friend of mine, I usually spill the secret sauce. I usually just say, uh, yeah, here's the deck I like or don't like, or here's the card I like, don't like. Uh, whereas if I'm talking to just kind of a random person, uh, my answer actually still depends on what I think of them. Uh, because I think um, different deck types work differently for different people. Uh, so I don't have this one piece of blanketed advice for everybody. And I'm also playing in this tournament, so I don't want to spill the secret sauce for everybody. Uh, but generally, I can say something that I can offer everybody uh, would be to uh, deliberately practice, which I know sounds stupid, uh, but it isn't because it's the opposite of actually what I think 
most people do right now in GOAT format. So just bear with me. I'm going to walk through an example. Uh, most people, for example, they'll start with a deck they like, uh, like Thunder Dragon Chaos Control. They just intuitively feel that's the deck type that is best call for the next tournament. They'll start playing with it. Maybe they get a streak. Some players, they get a streak of six wins. Some some can get up to like 19 wins or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But they'll get some streak and they'll they'll play against a deck like Flip Control with uh, Mask of Darkness and Time Seal and Solemn and Phoenix Windblast, etc. And then they lose. And then they go from not siding any Mystic Swordsman level 2 to suddenly siding two Mystic Swordsman level 2 or, you know, extra Dust Tornado or extra Royal Decree or whatever. Uh, and then maybe, maybe even after that loss or maybe after another loss to Flip Control sometime down the line, maybe they pick up Flip Control and they just, you know, they want to see what this deck's about. Uh, maybe, you know, this is something that's being slept on. So they try it out and then they see the holes. The match in their matches after, like they never get up to the streaks that they had with Thunder Dragon Chaos Control. Like they never win, you know, one player six, one player 19, but they never hit those streaks. But when they do lose, they see holes in the deck that reveal that it's not as powerful as it was in whatever match they lost. Uh, to it. So then they dump it and they most likely will go back to whatever it is they previously thought was the best deck. And I guess my point here is that I think the thing that all of us intuitively understand but never explicitly say is that process of going from one deck type to the next and then back to your bias, more often than not anyway, or that process of like adding and subtracting cards to your deck. Um, it is not an experience that is unique to any of us. And what we do, uh, ripples throughout the metagame in the same way that what other people did rippled, uh, until it, it affected our choices. And, uh, that when you're talking about how do you prepare for an upcoming tournament, that process is not testing that is playing. If anything, it is not preparing you for the matches to come. It is preparing you for the matches that have already happened. Uh, so you're behind the curve if you're going with the flow of the metagame. Uh, your job as a world competitor instead is to anticipate what will happen. And what I mean by that is, you know, of course, there's let's look at the last tournament results. Look at the last top four deck types uh, and expect that, you know, there's going to be some combination of some of those deck types uh, seeing more play and counters to that deck type seeing more play. And, you know, somebody's going to go rogue and they're going to play library FTK uh, and or empty jar or something like that. And so, yeah, there's anticipating like that. But there also needs to be anticipation on the level of, well, if I think Thunder Dragon Cast controls the best deck and I want to add Kaikus to my deck, um, well, you should expect that other people are going to do the exact same thing. And you should say, well, maybe I should be running Gravekeeper Spy because Gravekeeper Spy is decent against Kaiku. Well, I'm not making these actual points. I'm just saying that the, the point I'm trying to make is that you should be one step ahead of the game. Otherwise, you haven't yet carved out uh, any advantage across the field. And that's that. this is all assuming that you have a good grasp of... Um, how each card affects each matchup uh and i'm not talking about hey try to reinvent the wheel or invent a new deck type i'm saying sp specifically for most people who know all the deck types uh yeah that the, going with the flow that's the wrong approach you should have a uh, data-driven approach that you know what works for you, what your win rates are against all different deck types. You should look at what you anticipate uh, will be played and you should select uh, deck type and card choices that optimize your expected win rate for worlds. Chris, what decks are you expecting to see um, a lot at Worlds? I mean, obviously a lot of people are gonna be assuming chaos and that might be the, you know, the main deck that's seen at Worlds, but um, how much does this influence your decision on what deck to make for this competition, obviously without giving too much away? Okay, so I am recording this on September 27th, 
after Go Format Championship 10 has ended. Um, and I'm looking at that tournament in anticipation of what's to come for Worlds. And uh, even though I wasn't able to play in this tournament and I wasn't around to watch many matches, I did talk to a few people afterwards to just try to get a sense of what happened. And I looked at the bracket in particular. And I noticed a few things that are probably worth talking about. Uh, so first of all is I noticed that there are uh, a lot of names on the bracket that I don't recognize, which to me tells me that there was a lot of people hiding behind alternate accounts uh, for this, or there were for this event, uh, and that some of the deck types that these people played uh, were things that they had thought going into this event were viable for worlds. Um, now I don't know, you know, who who thought what specifically or how seriously they think any one of these decks were uh, uh, in terms of like viable for worlds but I do know that like something like 20 different deck types were being played and whoever played uh, cat control or final countdown didn't come in to try to waste their time uh, that said uh, one of the takeaways from this event are I think that those people are probably not going to use those decks uh, going forward uh, they're going to shift to something else they may not go to one of the four most popular decks uh but i think they're gonna do a shift um and that's to say that anyway that leads me into my next point that the four most popular decks were uh i think in this order uh thunder dragon chaos control uh chaos turbo and then split up between chaos warrior and goat control and i think that that's surprising for most people that number one chaos turbo wasn't the most popular deck and number two that uh chaos warrior was as popular as it was uh for me i think that's completely predictable you, you see chaos turbo doing really well you're going to see chaos warrior sort of trying to be played as a counter to that uh in particular i see that sd killa uh, he won this event after uh getting second at the previous event and then there was zazzles in two events prior to that with gear freed uh you know coming in second place i or top four or something like that so i think that going forward you're gonna see um more chaos warrior to try to combat uh chaos turbo and even thunder dragon chaos control uh, and I don't think you're going to see as much Chaos Turbo uh, from uh, the people who have been trying to make this work for the last few months, uh, because I think they realize that the metagame is sort of gunning for it right now. Um, I think you'll see that people who want to stick with a control deck go with Thunder Dragon Chaos Control. They might even run three scapegoats to try to, uh, and maybe even some Sakuretsus. I don't know. If, I don't know about that, but to try to counter this. Uh, uh, insurgence of chaos warrior uh you may see people for example aggro bomb that was piloted by one person as near as i can tell and that got to the finals so i expect you may see another person pick that same person uh run it at worlds or uh somebody who was influenced by that to run it at worlds um i also think that there i mean aggro bomb being one deck uh burn lockdown burn or, or drain burn being a different deck i think that uh you know no one used drain burn in this event and i didn't see any uh empty jar so you know that they weren't played here you know as far as rogue decks go i would expect that that's going to be something that somebody picks up going into worlds uh but overall i think my point here is that there were 20 something different deck types here with 60 something players if worlds only has half that many amount of players i would expect it like something like half as much variety uh so i wouldn't expect more than you know 10 12 different deck types at worlds uh, and maybe even far less i i just don't see that uh another thing about worlds that i would ex that i think is maybe counter to the conventional wisdom is I think most people think that the older players who are returning that qualified from topping an event back in 2005, um, I think people think that those players will play GOAT Control, um, but I don't think that's the case. I think that those players are coming back into the format and they're going to go on Dueling Book and they're going to see what's popular and they're going to see people play Chaos Turbo, in fact. Uh, and then they're going to try that out and then they're, they're going to see that that is a deck that they can easily win with without having the 15 years of 
hindsight that the rest of us have been able to accumulate. Uh, and that's going to impress them in a way that Goat Control never did. And I think that those returning players are going to default to Chaos Turbo. Uh, so I, I mean, I haven't talked to him, but like, for example, somebody like Miguel Garcia, I would expect to play something like Chaos Turbo. I know he's coming back. That's, that's something I would, I would expect from something, someone like him. That said, I also don't expect that many returning players from back in the day. Like if there's 30 people, um, who are playing at this event i'm making that number up i don't know how many people are actually registered i would expect something like six to ten with the you know three of my personal friends being among them uh, uh coming from back in the day and i and i just i don't see that many people i guess uh coming from back then. i think most of the people are going to be people who played most more recently on top of that uh one last point is I said before that there would be less deck types played. I think that's something that most people don't understand is that these 20 different deck types, they were piloted in part by uh, players who regularly show up to these tournaments and lose in rounds one, two, or three. Uh, that's different than the competition you're gonna see at Worlds. At Worlds, minus the people who have invites from being qualified in the past, uh, or from topping in the past, these people today have all demonstrated an ability, for the most part, to win tournaments, uh, modern tournaments, going undefeated. And that means that those players are going to be of a different caliber than the average level that you've seen throughout these tournaments in the past. So, altogether, bottom line, I expect fewer deck types than you've seen recently. Uh, I expect maybe Thunder Dragon Chaos Control being the most popular, uh, or maybe even being outshined by Chaos Warriors, which would be a really a really big surprise, a really big shift. Uh, and then after that, Chaos Turbo. And then down on the bottom of the rung, something like Go Control and then a bunch of one-offs. I don't actually expect to see a lot of Go Control at Worlds, oddly enough. So to circle back to the second part of the question that was asked and answer how this has affected my choice for the tournament, uh, I'm going to say that what I plan to use will be something that has a uh, the highest possible EV uh, against uh, a small variety of the field with a large focus on the four most played decks. Uh, but you know, not gaming out for more than 10 or 12 different decks. Chris, you once said in an interview that your favorite tech cards were Last Will or Green Kappa. How much do you think spicy tech cards will play uh, a part of winning this tournament? Do you feel that the standard tried and tested build will come out on top or do you believe that a spicy tech here and there will be the difference? Okay, so I was asked this question uh, a long time ago, uh, and I remember, in fact, playing a lot of post-CRV GOAT format around the time when I really fell in love with Last Will. Um, I don't feel that way about Last Will right now, <laughs> or even Green Kappa, if you were to ask me again. Um, and and that's so that, I just want to get that out of the way. Uh, to answer the real, the real question here, um, I don't think that spicy tech will have a big impact on this field. I think it will be a lot of tried and true, um, in part because I don't think that GOAT format players uh, have the stomach to experiment uh, for this particular tournament. It is the first of its kind. Um, it is something I think everyone wants to win. And I don't think anyone's going to show up with, like, for example, Injection Fairy Lily in their Chaos Turbo deck, uh, which would be interesting. And I, that would certainly qualify as tech. I think the extent of tech will be something like, you know, a Sur Priest or Kaiku or Creature Swap and some, you know, known commodity like that. Uh, I don't anticipate that anyone's going to try to reinvent the wheel here. When it comes to building a side for a competition like this, what advice can you give people with regards to what side cards they should be looking at? Also briefly discuss like your opinion on smokescreen sides and how good they can be or not be in a competition like this, or just in general, really. All right, so right off the bat, I'm not gonna tell you 
what side cards you should be looking at. Uh, first of all, it, it depends on what deck type you're using. But even if you know, we, me and you were playing the same, same deck type, I don't want you to side the cards that I side. Uh, so I'm going to not answer that part of the question. Uh, but I'll say that, um, you know, to tie into my point before uh, about the variety of deck types you'd expect to see in the field, um, I'm going to say that something that's been on my mind lately about the tournament structure uh, that most of these online tournaments have with the double elimination is that if you lose, for example, round one, when the field is most diverse, you wind up playing uh, more rounds than anyone else, or if you continue on any defeat, you wind up playing more rounds than anyone else in the tournament. Um, I don't know what the exact number is, but I think you play something like like an extra round for every tournament round to go when you're taking your first loss um which is to say like you know if you go undefeated in a tournament uh with of a size that has been going on lately i think you, you play like six matches but if you lose round one and continue through the tournament the rest of the tournament undefeated i think you play like 12 rounds or something like this some ridiculously high number like some number that's far more than the guy who went undefeated uh so it's really because there's no such thing as a hundred percent win rate you know you're only giving yourself more opportunities to lose when you lose early uh and and that's to say that if you're going to lose at all the best time to lose is the last round like you when you're in the finals and you have like a second shot uh at taking the championship that's the best time to lose if you lose before that the odds of you coming back and winning the tournament are really low in fact i don't know anyone that's ever done it for a go format championship or a format library championship and because of that tournament structure it is imperative that you win round one it's it's pretty important that you win, win round two but it's not as important as winning round one and and that actually continues on so that like the last round tends to be if, if you're still undefeated the last round is the least significant and round one is the most significant so you need to make sure that you're prepared for round one uh and for me i think that my you know safe tendency to side against a variety of the the, the variety of the field that i'm expecting is probably a good call um and that's probably what i'll do i don't anticipate using a transition side um but to that point that is another strategy that you can go with so certain deck types and this is all depends on what deck type you're using but certain deck types benefit from being really well equipped to handle a field uh, with their main already uh, whereas they can transition to either something that's unexpected uh, where you know they're countering the side cards that they're expecting their opponent to side in or they're they can transition to something that has like a ridiculously great matchup against one particular deck type so this is i mean there's a lot of examples of this but like one example would be like chaos turbo transitioning to gravekeeper where all of a sudden you go from a 50 50 in the mirror match to something where you're blowing out the mirror match when you drop necker valley uh and cast turbo can also hold its own against other deck types depending on how it's built uh like even burn for example uh can struggle if cast turbo draws uh, multiple copies of like for break for example or if you or if they're the kind that runs for break and phoenix windblast um you know you can be well equipped for that part of the metagame or like you know Cast Turbo, for example, could also do well against Reason and Gate Turbo because you have multiple sorcerers to banish uh, stuff and fill out your remove from play pile. You can also speed through your deck really fast, a lot faster than something like Go Control. Um, I'm just using Cast Turbo as an example. But my point is that uh, Cast Turbo is a good deck to try to transition side with. Aggro Bomb is another deck to transition side with. That's what the guy who just came second today uh uh wound up doing he i think he transitioned into uh burn um so you know when you're siding in your uh, threatening roars or sakus or whatever you're siding in like you're he's going into burn and it's that's a really good counter strategy uh for uh, what he's expecting people to side in after playing him game one so uh yeah uh, smoke screening good call
that's a that's straight up very powerful uh probably the most impactful use of a side deck um however you need to make sure that you are adequately prepared against the field uh, because like I said, the most important thing is getting through round one and then round two is round three, et cetera, et cetera. And that won't happen if you have a hole in your strategy, um, uh, for the expected metagame. Also, I wanted to find out, Chris, is there anyone in the tournament that you're excited and or worried about going up against? I mean, I know you're a legend of the game, um, but... There are a lot of promising new players coming into the format these days, and I was just wondering if there's anyone that you've got your eye on that could pose a, a challenge or an excitement for you to play against. Okay, so the short answer to this is worried? No. Uh, there's no one that I'm uh, scared of playing or that I think necessarily has a better shot than me uh, at winning the tournament or, or beating me. Um, so I'm not really worried about that. Uh, I would be worried in the sense of, for example, playing against Rymus Lizo or Paul Levitin, teammates of mine who I expect to show up. Uh, if I played them early, um, I'd feel sad that that happened so soon and that their experience would get cut short because I'm totally going to beat them. But uh, at the same time, I, I, to be honest, I'd be excited because uh, it's been a long time since... Uh, you know, we played against each other in a tournament setting. I think with Paul, like the last time I played him was when I beat him at Shonen Jump Houston. Um, and Rymus, I think the last time was in a regional in 2005 even. Um, and I guess, I guess I'm saying that I expect to play against people that I know, uh, friends of mine, uh, for example, Jazz, right? Like, uh, and if me and Jazz wound up in the finals, uh, I'm not going to be worried. Uh, but I am excited at that prospect of playing friends of mine who are trying their best uh, and counting on me to try my best. Uh, so that hopefully we have some good matches and, and have a great time. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited about the whole thing uh, and I can't wait. Chris, finally, thank you so much for your, all your time. But I just wanted to ask you this final question of... What advice would you give to someone who wanted to be like you and wanted to make competitive gold format or Yu-Gi-Oh a part of their life? Okay, so first things first. Uh, if you're looking to make competitive gold format a focal point of your life, uh, my advice would be to not do that. <laughs> I don't think it's a good idea uh, to make Yu-Gi-Oh! a focal point of your life, at least not for too long. Um, it's the kind of thing that I think is best when you dabble in. I know for me personally, uh, whenever I obsess over GOAT format, uh, I ultimately feel like I uh, made a mistake that I, and I come to regret it. I, I feel like I, you know, sacrificed something that wasn't as important so that I could continue being good at this stupid game and uh even though the format and even in the game at large uh is fun and exciting and uh, certainly a boredom killer uh but ultimately rewarding not only in, by the game itself but also you know through the friendships that you can uh have through it um given that i still think it's something best dabbled in um that said if you uh, find yourself, you know, obsessed with this for uh, months or even years on end, uh, my advice would be to take a break. Uh, I think that for basically anybody, it's the best move. I don't think that this is, it would be healthy for anyone to continue playing this indefinitely forever. Um, so that said, if you've taken a break and you're playing healthily um, and you're just in the process of dabbling uh, and you just want to be really good at it, uh, my advice, in addition to what I've said already in, in this about, uh, you know, deliberately practicing, uh, would be to uh, start uh, doing your own personal data collection. Uh, this it might sound weird and, and it might sound uh, Im imposing, um, but it's not actually. Uh, you could just think of it like, you know, instead of playing 
20 matches a week, I'll play 19 matches a week, and then I'll spend that time that for that nine, that 20th match, uh, you know, entering some data into a Google spreadsheet, uh, and that data would be your you know, your deck type that you used, uh, what games, like how many games you won and lost and what matches you won and lost and against what deck types and maybe whatever other de kind of data you want. But to the point is that I always felt that, how do I put this? Um, entrusting your intuition to solve uh, tough choices that you need to make about what cards that you run or what plays that you make um, sort of sounds to me like you're telling yourself that you already know everything and there's nothing more for you to learn or discover and that is just not true um, even me uh, even today I learn all the time and I mean, I, ha I think, I personally think I happen to have really great intuition. That said, I'm not perfect. I don't bat a thousand. Uh, I'm known for making really great reads, but I don't make perfect reads all the time. Um, and I guess all I'm saying is that um, if you rely on your intuition, you are not giving yourself the opportunity to grow in a way that I think somebody who's trying to excel at Go format ought to try to. Uh, and one thing that can help you, like demonstrably uh, and you know pretty, pretty sensibly, is to collect data to better understand what kind of player you are, like where you rank, um, and like how good you are relative to other people. And more specifically, you know, how you fare against other deck types. Uh, you might, see, like if the average person might have a 60% win rate against a particular deck type, and maybe you find that you have a 55% win rate against a particular deck type. And you're like, well, why is that? Why is that the case? What, what am I doing wrong? Right? Like, so like it's, it can give you some kind of indication of where you need to improve. Uh, it can also inform your judgment about what is the best deck type for you, given a particular metagame that you expect. Like for example, if you're going into worlds and I'm making this up, but if you think 30 people are all going to show up with, you know, 10 of deck A and 10 of deck B and 10 of deck C, there is some kind of expected win rate calculation you can make. If you know your per personal win rates uh, with a variety of different deck types against deck type A, deck type B, and deck type C. And uh, maybe that sounds a little, a little nerdy, but um, for me anyway, I have found that relying on the data that I've collected for myself has led me down uh, paths that I might not have otherwise been inclined to go down. Uh, so it's worked for me. It's what I'd recommend for you. Anyway, if you have made it this far, thank you for listening, and I look forward to seeing you at Worlds. Good luck. Wow, guys, um, just to end off, I want to say thank you so much, Chris, for being on the channel. You have definitely helped out not only um, new players, but a lot of old players, and what they can expect just in GOAT format and the world's coming up. Um, thank you so much for being on the channel. I really hope to have you on in the future. Guys, if you haven't already, please drop a like and sub below, and I'll be seeing you. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.